In this video, in this Bible study today, I'm going to show you how to make 2024 your best year you've ever had, like the best year you've ever had in your life. And, and, and I'm not going to be doing it from a place of theory. I'm not going to be guessing and theorizing and giving you something that I read in a book. Well, it is something I read in the book, but the book was the Bible. But I've also been applying it, and I know that it works because I've been applying it. And so I believe the Bible teaches, and I'm going to get into it when I get into the text, I believe the Bible teaches that human beings are the only thing God ever created that he created to be progressively productive. He didn't create creation to be progressively productive. He didn't create creatures to be progressively productive. But when he created creatives or creators, whatever you want to call us, we're made in his image. He created us to be progressively productive. And which means that our lives should be getting exponentially better the longer we live. That's just how it works. Um, and, and I also happen to believe that just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to get sicker and weaker and then die. I believe that the human life was designed kind of like a light bulb. It burns brightly its entire existence and one day it burns out, right? So another conversation for a different day, maybe I'll go into that. But just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to get weaker and sicker and all more. No, that's, don't let them sell you that lie. That ain't how God set it up. Anyway, so in this video, how, to make, how are you gonna make 2024 your best year? I, this is something I've been able to do, and I'm not, oh, man, you've been able to do this. You're so awesome. Hey, sometimes I'm awesome, sometimes not so much. But I've been able to do it to the degree where our, our profits in our business, we've had years where our business has grown exponentially end over end, right? Our YouTube channel has grown exponentially end over end. Um, it's like it, it, 2020, 2023, whatever that year was just ended, was like multiple times better than 2024 two was, and then I fully expect 2024 to be the exact same thing, a replication. So I'm going to tell you how that happens and show it to you in the Bible. It's mind-blowingly good. Okay, here we go. Galatians. Galatians chapter, I'm going to start in Galatians, then we're going to go back to Genesis because everything starts in Genesis, and that's what Genesis means. Brashit means in beginning, okay? So here we go. Genesis, Galatians chapter three, 6, verses 3 through 9. Here's what it says. I'm going to read it slowly so you don't miss all of these beautiful, juicy nuggets in here. Here's what it says. It says, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Now, it doesn't mean that you're nothing. It means you're nothing by yourself, right? Even, here's, here's what Jesus said in, in, um, in John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Without me, ye can do nothing. Don't think you're something in yourself, of yourself, by yourself, because if you think that, you're deceived. That's what that verse means. So I just wanted to make, give you a little context. Okay, you track it. But let every man prove his own work. Then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. By the way, this is one of the biggest problems we have in the United States of America, in the world right now, is the fact that we rejoice so much in other people's wins that we think they're our wins. What does that mean? We are so hyper-focused on the anesthesia of distraction by watching other people win on the electronic income reducer, whether that be the TV, your iPad, your phone, or your computer, or your smart TV, or whatever, we watch, in Tampa, we watch the Tampa Bay Bucks or the Tampa Bay Rays or the Tampa Bay Lightning win, and we say, we won! No, you watch them win. It's not the same thing. Why don't we go do something in our lives that serves people at such a high level that we winning means I didn't watch somebody else win, but I helped somebody else win? Okay, pump the brakes, man. You're getting all worked up early. Keep reading. But let every man prove his own work, then shall he have rejoicing in himself and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. So some of you may have heard me say in the past, every top has to sit on its own bottom. That's what I mean. Now, the Bible does tell us to bear one another's burdens, right? Which means when I'm with you, I'm, my responsibility to you is to bear, help you bear your burden. But when I'm with me, my responsibility to me is for me to bear my burden and not to expect you to bear my burden just because I expect me to bear yours. 
Did I say that too fast? My job is to expect me to bear your burden, but not expect you to bear my burden, even though, even though you expect, even though I expect you to bear mine. I mean, me to bear yours. Okay, y'all tracking. Okay. So here we go. Then it says, this is so good. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. This is one of, okay, so a lot of people ask me to teach on tithing. Okay, I'm not going to teach you on tithing right now, but I'm going to tell you where I think modern day churches make a mistake in the concept of tithing. In the Old Testament, the tithe was like a tax because they lived in a theocracy and the tithe was a tax. And the offering was to provide for the work of the temple or the work of the tabernacle. That was what the offering was for. But the tithe was the inheritance of the priests and the Levites, and it was also the inheritance of the widows and the orphans. So the tithe was to take care of the people who served in ministry and the people who were orphaned or widowed. It was not to pay for buildings that are not used 70% of the time. I'm like, it's in the Bible. And so if we're going to trans send or transfer that over to the New Testament, then the people who do the work of the ministry, see, here, here's what's really cool about motive. Motive is a really pure, I mean, here's what's really cool about money. Money is a really pure motive. If I am paying you to do something for me, I know exactly why you're doing it. You can't trick me. You can't trick me. You can't make me think you're doing it because you love me that much. Now, you might do something for me because you love me a lot, and I make the mistake of thinking you're doing it because you want me to think that. Or you might make, do something to make me think you love me so much, but you're really doing it because you, because you want me to think that. But I think you're doing it because you really love me. Are y'all tracking? And so, like, love is not a pure motive. I mean, it's a pure motive if you have real love. That's a pure motive. But it, you, it's not a purely perceptible motive. Money is a purely perceptible motive. When I pay you to do something for me, I can fully expect you to do that thing because I paid you. Are you tracking? Okay. So, so I think one of the biggest problems we have in modern day ministries is, well, one, uh, why am I doing this? Because I'm getting all sidetracked, but I'm going to say it anyway. One, we have too many preachers and pastors and evangelists and all the rest of that, ministers, selling blessings. Oh, you sow a seed into my life, God's going to bless you. I'm going to tell you right now, you sow a seed in my life, maybe God will bless you, maybe he won't. Right? So I, I don't know. I, like, I am not, I don't, I'm, I don't work in the kingdom of God blessing dispensing department. So my job is not to tell you to give me money so God blesses you. And I'm not, I am not judging anybody. I'm talking about me right now. Now, if somebody else wants to think I'm talking about them, I'm not. I have no judgment for people who do sell blessings, maybe they're right. I know that would not be right for me, right? Because the tithe was supposed to be the first 10% of your increase from your own field. So the first seed you have to sow is into your own field, which in the Old Testament would be your family business. Yes. And that family business produces an increase, and then the tithe of that increase would go to the workers of the ministry, and then an offering would go to support the work of the ministry. Anyway, so there's a little caveat inside the brain of Myron when it comes to tithing. I would go deeper into that, and one day I probably will, but it ain't going to be today, because we that ain't going to help, that side rabbits are not going to help you get to 2024. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I am going to teach you in this video more about how to make this year your best year ever than any video I've ever done and any video that anybody else has ever done. So don't get distracted <laughs> just because I'm getting distracted. Like, I'm already doing this, right? Maybe, maybe the fact that I'm chasing rabbits is God's way of getting you to pay close attention. Okay, maybe not. Okay, anyway, it's just a thought, just a thought. Okay, so here we go. Then it says, this, this is so good, verse 7, Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. Don't be deceived. We would say it like this today. All right, let's don't be confused about it. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This is known as the universal law. It's also known as the law of laws. It's also known as the law of the farm. I would call it the law of the garden. It's the law of sowing 
and reaping. Don't be deceived. Don't be confused. Don't trick yourself. Don't fool yourself. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Which means if you don't like what you're reaping right now, you might want to go find some new seed. Because everything that you have in your life today is the result of seeds you've sown in the past. And everything you're going to have in your life in the future is based on seeds that you've sown in the past and ones that you're sowing in the present. So if you desire a different harvest, sow a different seed. The, the principle of sowing and reaping is the, principle, the scientific principle of inputs and outputs. The key to success in life, how are you going to make 2024 your best year ever? I'm going to tell you, how, let me tell you how you're not going to do it. You ain't going to do it by trying harder. I'm going to work harder at what's not working and then I'm going to be more successful. No, you're going to be more tired. You're not going to be more successful. But the way to have more success in 2024 than you've ever had in your past is to change the inputs from the past. Change the seed and the harvest will automatically change. Okay, we, we go on somewhere. Most people, when they think of this verse, they think of it negatively. Like, if you do a bad deed, it's going to reap a bad harvest. Yeah, it will. But if you do a good deed, it's going to reap a good harvest. That's the context. How do I know? Well, look what it says in verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit of the spirit shall reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well doing. Let's don't get tired of doing good. Why? Because in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Here's what it said. Don't get tired of doing good because when harvest time comes, we will reap if we don't quit. Some people quit because seed time is not harvest time. But I've been sowing and I haven't reaped yet. Right, but here's the thing. You don't know when harvest time is. God knows that. Everything is beautiful in his time. There's a time to sow, there's a time to reap. There's a time to build, there's a time to tear down that which has been built. There's a time to plant, there's a time to pluck up that which has been planted. There's a time to, there's a time to heal, there's a time to kill. What? See, every season has its own reason. And see, we think that we get to determine the season. I don't get to determine the season. Here's what I get to do. Sow the seed and cultivate the seed until God brings the harvest. I love what Jim Rohn used to say. Jim Rohn used to say, Jim, Jim Rohn used to say, God said, you plant the seed, I'll grow the tree. He said, aren't you glad? He didn't say, I'll plant the seed, you grow the tree. How do you grow a tree? <laughs> I don't know how to grow a tree, but here's what I do know how to do. I know how to sow a seed. I don't know how to produce an outcome. I just know how to put in an input. This is why I don't set goals. This is why I don't do New Year's resolutions. This is why I don't turn over a new leaf. Some of y'all done turned over a whole orchard full of trees, a leaf, and still in the same place where you were when you turned over your first leaf. But instead, we got to change the input. Okay, I'm going to get to the point here in a minute. All this is foundational. Be not, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are the household of faith. What's he saying? Every deed is a seed that we are sowing into the garden of our future. Don't get tired of sowing the good seeds of good deeds into the lives of other people. They will eventually bring a harvest. He who's faithful over a few things, God will make him ruler over many. Our problem is we want to be ruler over many right now. I, I was faithful over a few things for a few minutes. Can I be a ruler over many now? No, that's not how it works. Now, here's what's cool. We're talking about sowing and we're talking about reaping. If we understand how God set everything up, by the way, I'm about to teach you right now of all the things I've learned in my life. I'm 62 years of age. I've learned a lot of really, really cool stuff. I've learned how to play triads on the guitar in the last couple of months. I've learned how to recognize all the notes on the fretboard. I've learned some things about different languages. I've learned some really cool principles about math and some really cool principles about science. And I learned how to read the instrument panel on an airplane. And I learned how to communicate with a control tower at an airport. I've learned how to do a lot of cool stuff. I've learned how to make lots and lots of money. But I've learned nothing that's even remotely close to what I'm about to share with you. In fact, what I'm about to share with you 
is the greatest success principle I've ever discovered in my life. And, and, it's gonna, and, and I, yes, it's simple. Yes, it's simple. I'm sorry, it's simple. But the truth is always simple. It's lives that are complicated. So what I'm about to do, I'm about to move over to my digital blackboard. I'm about to show you some stuff that when you actually get this, you will never be the same. And I'm glad I'm teaching this in January of 2024. Here we go. So, in Genesis chapter one, verse number one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the first thing that God established was what I call the platform. And I know I've taught on this before, but see, here's what I also know. You've heard me teach on this before, but if you got it, you'd already be living it. <laughs> like, church got a new pastor, pastor got up, preached a sermon. It was a really great sermon. All the people loved it. Okay, man, I'm glad we got this new pastor. Next week, he showed up, preached the same sermon. Next week, he showed up, preached the same sermon. Now the deacons start having meetings with you. Y'all know you keep preaching the same sermon. Next week, he preached the same sermon. They came to a pastor. You know you preach the same sermon three weeks in a row, don't you? He said, yeah. He said, well, when you, they said, when are you going to preach a new sermon? When y'all start living that one, I'm going to preach a new one. Right. So 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 I know I've taught this before, but don't just hear me say it. Live it. Are you tracking? Y'all tracking? OK. So the platform in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth. That's Genesis one one. The platform in the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, that's space. And the earth. Oh, I wrote the wrong thing. In the earth, that's matter. So this is why I call it the platform, because this is the arena that we as human beings play in. We play in the arena of time, space, and matter. This is so cool. This is the first thing that God established. He established the platform. We could call it the arena, but I'm going to call it the platform. Okay, so the reason people don't do better exponentially like God created us to do is because they don't really see the connection and they don't, they don't seize the connection that's there. So the, the, the platform is time, space, and matter. Everything that we do in our experience of life as human beings is governed by this platform of time, space, and matter. So in the beginning, that's time. There was no time before the beginning. There was just eternity. In the beginning, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. Are y'all tracking? Okay, so the next one is the parameters. Okay, now, what are the parameters? This is the, first, these, this is the first thing that God created. Like, this is the first thing. Okay, this is the first command. This is the first command. This, the first command happened thousands of years before the Ten Commandments. The first command, what is the first command? Okay, now here's what's really interesting. All of it's really interesting. The first thing that God tells us about God is that he's creative. God is love, but that's not the first thing he tells us about himself. God is omnipotent, but that's not the first thing he tells us about himself. God is omniscient, but that's not the first thing he tells us about himself. God is omnipresent, but that's not the first thing he tells us about himself. He's judge, he's just, he's righteous, he's holy, he's all that. None of those are the first things he told us. The first thing he told us is that he's creative. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Why did he do that? Because he's creative and therefore it is his nature to create. Why is the fact that God's creative the first thing that God told us about himself? because he created us in his image. So he wanted us to know why he created us, which means he created us to create stuff and he made us to make stuff. You were put here to create stuff. You were put here to make stuff. Why? That's how you exercise your God likeness. Okay? Now, here's what God said. He said, be fruitful. Parameter number one, be. Be fruitful. What is a fruit? A fruit is a living organism whose seed is where? In itself. Which means God put the seed inside the fruit, so that when the fruit is consumed, the seed is, exp the seed is exposed, then consumption creates production. It's not a bakery. There are no pieces of a pie. There is no pie. No one has too many pieces of pie. There won't be enough left over. Fortunately, when God created man, he didn't put him in a bakery. He put him in a garden. Why? Because in a garden, consumption creates production. It's the genesis, okay? And God desires for all of us to be producers, producers who... Prosumers, producers who consume and consumers who produce. If you're only doing one half of either one of those equations, you're missing the boat. Are y'all tracking? Wave at me if you're tracking. Okay, so, so be fruitful and then be multiplied. No, that doesn't make any sense. Be multiply, no. Have multiply, no, that doesn't make it. Do, multiply is a do. 
God said, be fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue. Be fruitful and do. Here's, here's, here's the formula. Be, do. Now, here's what's cool. Be is the input. Do is the output. So do is the output. Doing is the output of being. Being is the input. Okay, cool. So being is this whole seed thing. Okay. Be fruitful. Do multiply. The word multiply, by the way, means increase. Okay? Which means I'm supposed to increase. In what? Everything I do. Like I should live a life of increase. But not just increase, but perpetual increase. Today should be better than yesterday. This week should be better than last week. This month should be better than last month. This year should be better than last year. More productive. I need to have more increase in 2024 than I had in 2023. I need to have more increase in the next decade than I had in the last decade. Why? It's how God made me. Be fruitful. Do multiply. Do replenish. What's replenish mean? It means fill up the earth. Don't buy into this lie that everything that man makes is inorganic. Like cities are so inorganic. Uh, A city is as organic as a beaver dam in a creek in the forest. Why is it? It's as organic. Like Tampa, Florida, Miami, Florida, Chicago is, is as organic as a beehive, as an eagle's nest. Why is it that when animals, lower life forms, bahima, and it is what it is, when lower life forms use their limited amount of creativity, very limited amount, to create something to make their lives better, we call that organic. But when human beings use our unlimited creativity to make our lives better, we call it inorganic. You know why? Because we're deceived by the lie of the enemy. Planes, trains, and automobiles are as organic for us as a beehive is for a bee. Okay, I'm going to stop fussing. B, fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, fill up the earth with the stuff you increase. Well, if you're increasing, it's impossible not to fill up, right? Because that's the result of increase. And then it says, do, do, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue. What does subdue mean? Subdue means to trample down. Hey, I thought it was building up. Why am I trampling down? Because God is showing us, even in his first command, that disruption follows intention. When you decide to do something that's going to make your life better, the first thing that shows up is something hard. Why? Because there is no challenge, and there is no champion if there is no challenge. It's the challenges that make us the champion. It's the challenges that give us the opportunity to become a champion. Do you realize if you have a Super Bowl or an NBA playoff or um, a Wimbledon and there are no opponents, there can be no championship. It's the things that oppose you that make the things that you're producing more valuable. But that, why do they make it more valuable? Because they make you a better person. Disruption always follows intention. Okay, be fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue, and then the last thing he said, have dominion. So here's the formula for success. 2024, you ready? I know I've said it before, but you didn't get it last time, so I'm gonna say it again. Be, do, have. Don't be, can't do. Can't do, can't have. The reason you're frustrated right now is because you desire to have something and have attempted to have something and have set a goal to have something, but you've not done the thing that gives you the right to have it. And the reason you haven't done the thing is not because you don't desire to do the thing, it's because you've not become the person who can do the thing. I believe that every human being, the reason personal growth, personal development, personal preparedness is essential every day of our lives, Lord, teach me to... Uh, apply, teach us to apply our hearts unto wisdom. I mean, teach us the number of days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The reason personal development is so important is because I have to be getting better every day to prepare myself for the next day. There is no there. Okay. So be, do, have. Don't be, can't do, can't do, can't have. And most people are frustrated because they desire to have. They wrote down on a goal somewhere. I'd like to have X, Y. I want to have a million dollar a year without doing the things that'll give you a million dollar a year or without learning how to become the person who can do the things that'll give you a million dollar a year. I want to find my husband. I want to find my wife in 2024. But here's the problem. You're a woman who wants to find a husband, but you haven't yet become a wife. You want to attract a husband to a girlfriend. You want to attract a wife to a boyfriend. Am I talking too plain? You want to attract millions of people to something that has never made a millionaire. But this is the thing I love. Well, good. You get to love it and be broke doing it. I, don't get, I didn't create wealth doing the stuff I love. I created wealth doing the stuff other people love. 
I love what Warren Wiersbe said. I don't love everything he said, but this is one that he said that I like. He said, what I love is my hobbies. What other people love is my business. That's what I said. Mm. Right? And so, be, do, have. These are the parameters. Do you realize that being is the seed that produces doing as the harvest? Ah, oh, this is so good. Don't get tired of becoming the person who gets to become the person who can do the thing. And I know you can do the thing that you couldn't do yesterday, but you've not yet become the person who can do the thing you can't do tomorrow. That's why growing perpetually is essential if you're going to have success and not just status. Are y'all tracking? So being is the seed to the harvest of doing, but watch this, doing is not just the fruit of doing, it's not just the fruit of the harvest, but it has seeds in it. What is it the seed of? Like doing is the seed of the harvest of having, and this is the harvest. Man, when you get this, when you get this, it's a wrap. Because then you can focus on the only metric that you can change anyway, which is the only metric that matters, you becoming the person who can do the thing. I must become better. Why? I'm alive and I'm made in the image of God and I'm not enough like him yet. So I'm going to keep on working on me so I can become more like him so I can be better prepared to do the thing he put me here to do. And what's cool is I don't have to do it by myself because he planted an aspect of the seed of his creativity inside of me so I can do the thing. I can become the person who can do the thing that I couldn't do yesterday. Hallelujah. 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 That was a falsetto, by the way. My voice is not that high. So, be, do, have. Now, this is so cool because now these are, I'm going to just put, put personality traits. Okay, what are they? Well, this is identity. So, being speaks to who I am. That's my identity. By the way, if you understand this, when you see the connection between this, time, this is so good, this is so good, time is the seed of being. The reason time exists, this, this, part of the, this part of the platform exists for this part of the parameters. Time exists for the purpose of being. Anything you're going to become that you're not right now is gonna take time. And see, your problem is you wanna rush the washing machine. And you want to skip the rinse cycle. Mm -hmm. A lot of dudes in here are like, what's a rinse cycle? <laughs> See, my mom taught me how to wash clothes, so I know what a rinse cycle is, right? Okay, anyway. You have to go through all of the steps. You can't skip steps. Time, it's going, for you to become the person who can achieve the thing that you desire to achieve, you have to become the person. When you become more obsessed with becoming the person than you are with having the thing that becoming that person will get you, that's when you start to grow. See, I'm hyper obsessed with become, Myron becoming better. I'm not hyper obsessed with making money. I just happen to make a lot of money because I've been hyper, hyper obsessed with becoming the best version of Myron for decades. And I'm not the best version of Myron. That's why I'm still hyper-obsessed hyper with it. Because every day I can become better than I was the day before. Hallelujah! So, time is a platform, and it exists for the purpose of being. We don't say to my four-year-old granddaughter, here, here's the keys. Go to Publix and get me some almond milk. Not that she's incapable, just she hasn't grown into the person who can drive a car yet. She can drive her little cars, but she can't drive my car yet. Right? She's not yet become the person. And in order for her to become the person, it's not going to take more lectures from me and more lectures from her parents to help her become the person. It's not going to take more of her trying harder to become the person. None of that has anything to do with it. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take time and consistency and her developing every day. And see, here's the problem. We graduate from high school and we stop growing. And we graduate from college and we stop growing. And we get a promotion or a job and we stop growing. Or we join a mastermind and have some success and we stop growing. But if you will hyper-obsess over becoming the person who can solve the problems of your ideal avatar, if you will hyper-obsess over, hyper over that, oh, all the success you've ever sought will show up in your life. When you least expect it or when you most expect it. It, doesn't, like, it becomes nebulous. See, you set goals because somebody you respect told you to set a goal, 
And then when you don't have it, you're disappointed, and then you become apprehensive about setting another goal. But I'm telling you right now, just don't set the goal. Set the input objectives. I'm going to become a person who can do this. I'm going to become a person who reads my Bible every day. I'm going to become a person who reads a personal development book every day. I'm going to become a person who prays for my family every day. I'm going to become a person who looks for opportunities to serve people every time I'm around a person. I'm going to ask myself, how can I serve them? 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 How can I become a person of service? How can I be? Because you can't become a person of value to people until you're seeking to serve them. And you're going to take it like, and then, then you can let the process take as, long, take as long as it takes. Like, we have 550-something thousand subscribers on YouTube. Would I love to have 5 million? Yeah. Guess when I'll have 5 million? When the inputs of me becoming a better YouTuber produce the results of me having 5 million subscribers. And until then, I got what I got. Until I become more than I've been. And I'm telling you, like, you look at me and you think I'm good at YouTube. I look at me and think, I haven't even gotten started. Like, I'm still, like, every day, YouTube is one of, a part of my business. It's a very important, critical part of my business. Every day, I learn something about YouTube that I didn't know the day before. And every time I do a video on YouTube, I learn something about YouTube that I didn't, learn before, that I didn't know before I did it. And so, you want to be good without the iterations. But I'm here to tell you, there is no good without the iterations. And the iterations precede the being good by years, sometimes. I'm okay with that, though. I'm not in a hurry. I decided when I became hyper-intentional on YouTube that I'm going to post at least one YouTube video a week for 10 years, and maybe in 10 years, I will be good. And maybe in 10 years, I'll have a million subscribers. And if I do, that's great. And if I don't, that's great. But what I am going to do is I'm going to hyper-focus on this part. I'm going to let the... And then I'm going to do at least one video a week. Now we're up to seven videos a week, right? But we would never be at seven videos a week if I wouldn't have committed to doing one and then learning the lessons from doing one and then doing two and then learning the lessons from doing two. Oh, we can do, then we, at one point we did three long form videos a week. Sometimes we still do it. You say, Myron, what are you saying? I'm saying, King Solomon said one of the reasons he wrote the book of Proverbs was to, to, um, to receive instruction of wisdom. Wisdom is skill. So to receive instruction from doing the thing that you can only learn when you're doing the thing. So you want to learn lessons before you get started. You know what people who succeed do? They get started so they can start learning lessons. That's why I don't set goals. It's input. I'm going to do the thing. I don't care how it's going to turn out some kind of way. And guess what I can do once it turns out some kind of way that I can't do if I don't do it? I can measure how it turned out. I can monitor what that result is, I can make adjustments, and I can control my next input. But if I don't do it, I don't have anything to measure, monitor, or adjust, or control. How many of y'all tracking? And see, some of you, you don't, have any th- like, you don't have anything to measure, monitor, adjust, and control because you're waiting until you have a perfect seed before you sow it. There is no perfect seed. There's just good seed. And all good seed don't fall on good ground. And that's okay. Some, seed, some of the seed that you sow out into the marketplace is going to fall on the ground of misunderstanding. It's going to cause people to misunderstand you. It's going to cause them to call you names. It's going to cause them to judge your content. And then you're going to buy it. Oh, I need them to believe in me, though. I can't create anything because they said something bad about me or negative about me in my comments. Oh, what was me? Man up. Woman up. Quit tripping. Stop acting like a baby. Okay. In Christian love. Okay. So, so the purpose of time is becoming, but the purpose of space is doing. Like, this is a, another seed for doing. If I'm going to do something, I need a space. By the way, you want to create something? You want to write a book? You want to write a book? Give yourself some time. Set a time. This is when the book's going to start. This is my objective of getting it done by. And then give yourself a space. This is where I'm going to work on my book. You want to do an event? Set a time. Then get a book of space. Nobody shows up but you, at least you showed up. And you learn something, okay? Be, do. The purpose of matter is having. The, this, is the, this is the seed and the harvest. Like, I don't deserve to have until I do something. No, so, so time, becoming, this is my identity. But here's the problem with identity. Most people have no idea who they are. You know why? 
because you've already bought into your identity. You know what your identity is, right? That's all the things, all the people in your past told you you are not, either by their words or by their actions, and you bought into it. You bought into your identity, so you have no room inside you for your identity. You believe so much in who you're not that there's no room in you for who you are. And you're always attempting to overcompensate for who you think you're not because they told you you're not. And they told you, the, 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 the so-called teachers in the miseducational, misdirectional system told you you have a learning disability and you believe them. They told you you're not smart and you believe them. So you've been going around fulfilling their lying prophecy about your life, your whole life, and you think you're not smart because they told you you weren't smart and you don't even know they told you they, you weren't smart because they were having a bad day. Mm -hmm. you're, you're still attempting to overcompensate for the coach that cut you when you were in junior high school and prove that you're good enough. You're responding to your lie identity or worse than work, like doing your best to overcome that, the lie identity, you hide behind it. You hide behind your lie identity. I'm, I'm not important. I can't be loved. I can't be, uh, uh, people, I don't, I don't want to be around people. People, but people are, the, are the problem. No, your perception of people is the problem. And your identity, our identity sometimes comes from people that we love. Can you imagine if when Joseph's brothers hated him for his words and his dreams, he said, well, I guess this is not a good dream. I'm going to see if I can't go find me another one. Can you imagine if David would have bought into the lie of his brothers? We know your, naughty, your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. You came down to see the battle. David was the youngest, so I know he was a smart aleck. No offense to my youngest brother. Uh, I know he's a smart aleck because little brothers and little sisters know how to needle older brothers and older sisters. Can I get a witness? So if I were David, or if, here's what I think David said, knowing what I know about little brothers and older brothers, David said, what battle? Y'all ain't fighting, y'all had. I didn't come down to watch y'all had. I'll fight. Y'all can watch me fight. Right? But what if David had bought into his identity? And said, well, they think I'm just trying to be prideful. I don't want to be misunderstood. So I'm going to prove that I'm not prideful. So I'm going to go back to my dad's house and let them fight the giant or keep hiding from it. You cannot let your identity control your actions. You are only who God says you are and no one else. You're not your lie identity. You're not your my identity, which is your, your attempt to overcompensate for your lie identity. It's just a different kind of lie identity. I'm going to do this to prove that I'm more than they told me I wasn't. And you ain't that either. Mm -hmm. Can I get a witness? But I am telling you, if you don't know it yet, I'm going to give everybody a little eye contact so you can know I'm talking to you. If you don't know it yet, I know you are great. I know you are great. In the, I know you're great, even if you don't know it. How do you know, Myron? How do you know I'm great? I know you're great because you're made in the image of a great God. How could you be anything other than great? You were created for a great purpose. Why am I struggling? You're struggling really hard right now because the purpose that God created you for is bigger than you are right now. And the only way for you to get bigger is for you to stay in the furnace until the one who quenches the fire shows up and shows out. So this is your identity. And if you don't know who you are, you, you can't do, like, you're, you, everything you do is misguided when you don't own your identity. I am who God made me to be. I'm going to do what he called me to do, what he created me to do. And some people are going to like it. Some people are going to hate it. My job is not here to please people and serve myself. My job is to please God and serve people, period. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it if it makes me a lot of money or if I end up living under a bridge, I'm going to do what God put me here for. If it finds me a spouse, I'm going to do it with a spouse. And if I'm single for the rest of my life, I'm going to do it single. And if it builds me a successful business, I'm going to do it. Or if I've got to get a job at McDonald's, I'm going to keep fulfilling my purpose and let that take me where only that can take me. And wherever it takes me, I'm cool with it. I'm so cool with it, I don't want to fool with it. I'm going to stay on track. Then you're, you're doing, this speaks to your activity. Most people think that the way to have more, okay, this is your property. The way to have more property is to do more activity. But when you attempt to do more activity without increasing your identity, all you're gonna do is frustrate yourself. Because you are attempting to do more than you are. It 
can't happen. It's like, it's, like, it's like attempting to drive your car farther than the amount of gas you have in it. It can't work. The gas is the input that keeps the engine running. The being is the input that keeps your activity running. So this identity is the seed of activity and activity is the seed of property. And you, what you do is you try to intensify this. This is called trying harder. This is where everybody tries harder. Stop trying harder and just like, ask God to show you who you are. And then when he shows you, believe him. More than you believe your third grade teacher. More than you believe your seventh grade coach. More than you believe the boss that hated you. More than you believe your spouse who abused you. More than you believe your parents who abandoned you. More than you believe anybody. Believe what God says about you. He's getting you ready for what he already has ready for you. And you can't win in 2024. Can't do more in 2024. Can't get in a higher gear in the new year until you own the identity that God gave you. I had polio as an infant. I'm colorblind, dyslexic. If I went to school today, they'd send me home with a note to my parents. Your son has ADD, ADHD, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They send me home with the whole alphabet. You know why? Because it was hard for me to pay attention in school. And it wasn't because I had ADHD. Yeah. They had KPAD. What is that? K, K. Uh, K-M-A-D. You know what that is? Keep my attention deficit. They were boring. (laughs) Anyway. Huh. I am here to tell you, this is game changer. It'll change your life for the rest of your life. Like Like, if you hyper focus here, This will be the natural outcome. Like, so into the being, read more books, pray more and ask God to reveal you to who you are. And then once you find out who you are, like, do not procrastinate becoming. Because here's what's really interesting. Like, becoming is about learning and growing, right? But one, it's it's fascinating. Some people don't do more because they don't know what to do. Some people don't know more because they're not doing the things they know. One of the keys to learning more, like to getting more of God's purpose revealed to you, is doing the stuff he already showed you. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. Oh, so doing what I know is a precursor, it's a prerequisite to knowing, to going, to doing, to becoming. Got it. I have to be willing to do the stuff I already know. So here's here's how most people live their lives. God, I'm going to ignore the last 75 things you told me to do. Can you show me something new? Heaven's open. No! Go do the last thing, and the thing before that, and the thing before that, and the thing before that. How many of y'all tracking? I'm telling you, if you will do this... Oh, by the way, what do we read? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth... That shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Don't get tired of sowing into the becoming. Because in due season, when it's our time, we shall reap if we faint not. I was was talking to one of my mentors recently, last year. Went to Pennsylvania, one of my mentors. When I was broke as a joke and ready to choke. This was back in the early 2000s, late 90s. I didn't know it was late 90s. Like he was my mentor. I was in a multi-level marketing company. He was my upline. He was making 90,000 a month in the, in, the eight, in the 90s when 90,000 a month was like way more than it is right now. Y'all understand how inflation works, right? If there are only $1 million in circulation, there are more than that. If, as soon as they create, print another million and put it in your dollar, every dollar you had before is now only worth 50 cents. Okay, that's how inflation works. They print more money and the money that you have becomes worth less. Okay, so, so back in the 90s, 90,000 a month was a lot of money, a lot more than it is right now. And so I had, I had lunch with him and I bought him lunch because he was, he, was, he was my mentor. Like he traveled all over the country and even out of the country to do trainings for me and my team. And my team was like really, really little. I was making, you know, a few thousand, you know, five, six thousand a month. But I was working and I was producing some revenue for him and he supported me. 
And when I was really broke, he even loaned me some money one time and told me I didn't even have to pay him back. Like, to me, what was a lot of money back then, like $7,000. I said, I don't worry about it. I'm like, what? So I went to lunch with him recently, last year. I said, I just want you to know how much I appreciate your friendship, appreciate your example, appreciate you being a believer who actually lives the stuff you talk about and being such a good example in business. I appreciate that. You know, he said something to me. He said, Myron, you passed me a long time ago. But if that's true, and I don't know that it is, but if that's true, one of the reasons I passed him a long time ago, because I wasn't racing with him. I was racing with me. I can only run my race. Here's the cool thing. The race you're in, the only thing you have to do to win it is finish it. Because you're the only one in it. Live your life in your purpose. Live your life on purpose. Find some people to serve. Be, do, have. In 2024, your life will change forever. This is the last thing we're going to say. How do, we, how, do we, how do we increase our awareness of our identity? Through a concept that I call intentionality. What does that mean? I become hyper-intentional. When I become hyper-intentional, it increases my awareness of who I am. Are y'all tracking? Okay. Um, so intentionality, what's the opposite of intentionality? Distraction. Here's what's really interesting. If you read the Bible, one of the things you'll notice, it's, it's in any endeavor in life in which you're going to improve, donting the don'ts is the priority over doing the do's. Stopping the things that won't get you there will produce a multiplied effect over just doing the things you're supposed to do. What do I mean by that? So if you stop eating the things that contribute to poor health, that will impact your health faster than just working out more. Fitness, n- nutrition without fitness is inefficient, but fitness without nutrition is dangerous. You need both, but stop eating the stuff. Like, I got stuck. I gained a bunch of weight when I was traveling at the end of last year. I got stuck, 192, and I was doing all these working outs like a crazy person who wasn't losing any weight. And I said, okay, no more carbs until next year. And it's already next year and still no more carbs. But I lost 11 to 12 pounds over that time. It just fluctuates back and forth each day. Not by working out harder. I worked out less. But I cut off all the stuff that was contributing to the outcome I didn't desire. Most of the things that we are doing in our lives that are causing us to push our success further into the future are the distractions that we're focused on. By distraction, I mean anything we're focused on that doesn't move the needle in our favor. Anything you're focused on in your business that doesn't move the needle in your favor is a distraction. The opposite of distraction is intention. Our activity, we, we increase our activity with ingenuity. How many of you have ever felt stuck? Ingenuity. I felt stuck. Well, ingenuity is... I use my ingeniousness to discover an approach I didn't have before. Does that make sense? So I keep doing a different approach. It's like when I was working with my dad, I learned this when I was in elementary school. My and my dad were working on an old flood car. We were attempting to take off the exhaust manifold. One of the bolts was frozen, I mean, was rusted on. We tried a torch. We tried a hammer and a chisel. Nothing was coming off. My mom called us for lunch. We're going in for lunch. I said, Dad, it won't come off. He said, oh, it's coming off. It's coming off. He said, you know why it's coming off, son? I said, no, sir, because we got a brain. It don't have a brain. Hmm. What what is he saying? He's saying, we're going to use our ingenuity. It can't come up with any new ideas. All it can do is what it's already doing. But we can keep attempting different approaches until we find one. And then we increase our property with intensity. I'm telling you, when we apply this to our lives, it will take us to a level that we did not know existed. I'm not giving you a theory. I'm not telling you something I've read in a book. I've learned this by watching the results of the outcome of all these seeds I've been sowing over the last couple of decades. I'm so joyful for you because when you do this, I know it'll work. I don't hope it'll work. I don't think it'll work. I know it will work. It already works. It's a principle. It's, 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 It's God's automation. It's already woven into the fabric of the universe. And now it's your turn to win. Go make 2024. Using these principles. Go watch this video every day if you have to. Go make 2024 your best year ever. I promise you, if you will focus on this, you'll be blown away come December 31st, 2024. In the meantime, in between time, stay blessed by the best. I hope this video blesses you. Bye for now.
Şimdi 